Okay, now that your glucose levels have been restored, uh, let's get back to the agenda. We're going to hear next from Terry Manolio, the director of the Division of Gen Genomic Medicine, who's going to give you a report on a recent workshop on Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis. Terry? Put on, on. There we are. Um, that's the English uh, um, pronunciation, I think. The, the British, the Bri necro necrolysis is the uh, yeah, the British one. So what do I do to get my slide to come up? Because I had it up here before. Oh, Eric. Um, what'd you say? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's always your fault, you know, no matter what happens. So great. All right, this was a, a meeting that uh, we held. Um, now about three months ago or so, sorry, six months ago. This was in March, um, and, uh, and and we came to this topic uh, because of a series of meetings that we've held as part of the Genomic Medicine Working Group, which you'll be hearing about um, next. But uh, but just to, to remind you, we do have a working group of this council that focuses on genomic medicine implementation in particular. Um, and it, this isn't is this picking me up, or I'll just hold it. Um, and one of those one of those meetings then um, focused on international um, uh, applications. Uh, sorry, so that's this one, uh, the global leaders meeting that we held in January of 2014, where we brought together a, a bunch of groups that were uh, implementing genomics around the globe. Um, we were thrilled that we actually had parts of the world that we don't normally see in our meetings, and, and a particular group in Thailand. Uh, really blew a lot of us away with the program that they were doing in uh, uh, pharmacogenetics and, and adverse reactions to drugs. Um, so they had a, a number of things that they were talking about, and this is a difficult picture to look at after lunch, so sorry about that. Um, but they were doing, working specifically in Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, or SGS-10, uh, which is a severe, probably the most severe, cutaneous adverse drug reaction, if not the most severe adverse drug reaction in which essentially um, an, an immune reaction, autoimmune reaction is set up that causes, uh, can cause up to the entire skin surface to slough off, uh, both externally and internally. So, so the respiratory tract, the GI tract, the corneas, um, it is just a, a horrible, horrible disease. I saw uh, one case of it as an intern, um, and not something that you ever want to see again. And what happens is what's shown here is basically there's separation, there's death of the cell layer between the dermis and the epidermis, and the epidermis just, just comes off in sheets. So um, this was something that until about 12 years ago was believed to be totally idiosyncratic. Nobody had any idea what would cause it. It was just like lightning striking. Uh, until this group in Taiwan um, started to look at cases because they seemed to have a higher um, uh, prevalence incidence of it in their, in their country, and in particular found um, that in 44 of 44 cases, a particular HLA allele was present um, in people who developed this condition after carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic. Um, and it was this, the particular allele was only present in 3% of those who were tolerant to this medication and about 9% of the general population in that, uh, in that country. So this was a very strong indicator that this particular uh, HLA allele was a risk allele uh, for this condition. Uh, subsequently, there was another uh, allele in more in, in um, uh, European populations, HLA 3101, uh, uh, and shown here are the associations with that, sort of a 26-fold uh, odds ratio with 3101 um, for SGS10, and then for other types of milder hyper <coughs> hypersensitivity, uh, a nine-fold odds ratio. So still, as a cardiovascular epidemiologist, which I, I started out as, we never saw odds ratios of nine and certainly not of 26. Um, so, so there are a number of alleles like this that uh, predispose to this condition. Um, <clears throat> and this led the, uh, the FDA to issue a warning, basically saying that anybody who was going to get carbamazepine who was of Asian ancestry should be considered for screening for this allele. Uh, and this was criticized because it was uh, it basically noted that clinicians, clinicians have to determine if a patient has ancestry across broad areas of Asia, and how is somebody supposed to know that? Wouldn't it be way better to just have the testing available and then say, you know, have a little pop-up in, in your medical record that says, caution, this patient carries this risk allele when you're about to prescribe this drug, you know, consider prescribing something else or watching them carefully. And the, uh, the, what the Thai group showed us was something that they have done that is, is uh, one step back from that but still involves screening large numbers of people who are about to get these drugs. And they then produce a card that looks like a credit card uh, that has uh, basic, oh, sorry. 
you know, but, um, that has a, a patient's name, the outcome of the assay, the date, the interpretation, and this particular person uh, carried this risk allele, and they were at high risk from this. You turn over the card, uh, and it says, you know, this person is at high risk. Please contact us if you want more information, but uh, consider not using this drug. And they give these uh, out to their uh, patients. <clears throat> they screen for about 10 different risk alleles for different uh, drugs that are commonly uh, associated with bad uh, reactions in their population. Uh, and they then showed the cost effectiveness of this uh, approach in, in um, uh, Thailand. Uh, and you can see here incremental cost effectiveness of about $7,000 per quality adjusted life year gained in uh, uh, certain uh, populations of patients. The, the sort of standard threshold for, for cost effectiveness is about $50,000 in this country, uh, $50,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. That's based on uh, renal dialysis. And actually, I think it's been inflated now up to even 100000 So. So 7,000 is really good um, and, uh, and something that, uh, that we would consider implementing. Recognizing that that cost effectiveness ratio depends on the prevalence of the allele. If the allele is much rarer in your population, you're going to have to test a whole lot more people. Uh, they estimated in Thailand you'd need to test about 350 patients to present, prevent one case. And they've shown then that since they implemented the screening, the, their incidence has come down really quite, quite nicely. This is just in, in men and women here. Um, because this was cost effective, the government, which is the single payer of their health healthcare system, uh, implemented universal screening. Uh, they've had declines as well as uh, in Taiwan have been reported, Malaysia, Singapore, um, all have shown cost effectiveness as well. So a very, you know, exciting story and one that really grabbed our attention uh, when, we, when we heard about this. And so we kind of came back and said, all right, how much is the NIH doing in this area? What's, what's our portfolio of research in SJS-10? Because it was fairly clear to us that, uh, that there were, you know, more um, uh, variants that could be found and, and other ways to, uh, to go about dealing with this. And unfortunately, it was kind of a barren desert. You know, we had maybe one tree standing here uh, that was uh, a, a single grant in a very, very basic area. Uh, so talking with our, our colleagues at other institutes, it was pretty clear that this was an area that, that not much was happening. Uh, and one would think because this is a skin condition, obviously the, the, uh, the skin institute would be heavily involved. It's actually not a skin condition. It's an immunologic condition. It's just the skin is the end organ. So they didn't have very much in it, but they were interested and, and wanted to get involved. Um, the, obviously, the, the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Immunology uh, has, a, has a footprint in um, drug reactions as well. Uh, certainly, this one now being genomic or genetic, at least, we, we would be involved. Um, the um, um, NIDDK uh, has recognized a, a number of alleles or helped to identify, really, alleles associated with severe drug-induced liver injury. And so um, they have uh, an interest in the area. NCATS, because this is a relatively rare condition, particularly in the U.S., their Office of Rare Diseases uh, is relevant. The Neurology Institute, because many of the drugs that cause this are in, uh, uh, used in patients, you know, who have epilepsy, neuropathic pain, et cetera, so they were quite interested. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, because it's a pharmacosurveillance issue um, and one that they wanted to get involved in and have been involved in. And then there were, there were other groups that were sort of, uh, had some, some lesser involvement. The Eye Institute, because there are, can be fairly severe sequelae, um, including blindness. Uh, the cl our clinical center does screening for some of these variants. Uh, the Genomic, uh, General Medical Sciences Institute uh, is, is obviously involved in pharmacogenetics and has helped to identify some of these early associations. And NIMH for some of the same reasons the drugs are used in, in schizophrenia and other, other conditions. So we kind of got together a, a coalition of, of these groups and put together a workshop um, that was held in March. This was to review the current state, you know, sort of where we are, what our knowledge is, uh, look at the role of genomics and pharmacogenetics in this condition and how we can uh, help to eradicate it and then identify gaps on needs and, and priorities for research. This is the planning group, uh, ably led by my colleague Carolyn Hutter here at the Institute. And this is the group, handsome that they are. Um, and we uh, reviewed the current state of knowledge. By the way, all of this is on the NHGRI website. The, the uh, sessions were video uh, taped and archived, and then um, uh, the slides are up as well. Uh, and you can see the incidence quoted, it's rare, about one per million of the general population, but about 100 to 1,000 times more common in, high, in users of high-risk drugs, um, and about 1,000 times greater in HIV-AIDS. So here's an, an area where, uh, where we really can have some relevance in, in that. Uh, these are some of the commonly um, implicated drugs, but there are others. Um, 
carbamazepine is anti-epileptic. This is uh, used for gout, and there's concern that as its use increases, um, we're going to see many more cases of this because the, the risk alleles for this are not limited to the Southeast Asia, whereas the identified risk alleles for some of the others are. Uh, trimethoprim sulfa is Bactrim or Septra. It's a, a commonly used antibiotic. And this I mentioned is an antiviral for uh, HIV AIDS. <clears throat> There's a high mortality, um, 30 to 50 percent, in fact, and, and higher at the ends of the age spectrum, as you might imagine. A high risk of recurrence if you're exposed to the same drug or a chemically similar, similar drug. Uh, risk seems to be higher in Southeast Asia. Um, more than 80 percent are believed to be gen genetically mediated, though there do seem to be some that, uh, that may be mediated by uh, uh, other uh, means, uh, rather than specific drugs uh, in response to infections, viruses, and things. Uh, and there have been multiple risk variants identified since this initial identification, and as I mentioned, screening efforts have actually reduced incidence in several countries. Uh, we pulled together some data from the people at the, the workshop in terms of the frequency of the, uh, the particular alleles that are associated with this. They're shown down here. 5701 is associated with a back of ear sensitivity, which is one of the first um, um, major genetically mediated adverse uh, reactions that, that has been um, um, essentially you know, gotten rid of uh, by genetic screening. Uh, 5801 is for allopurinol, and then 1502 for carbamazepine. And if you look at sort of a scale of allele frequencies, you see that they, they're really only a couple of percent at most in people of Mediterranean ancestry. But if you go up to India, well more than, than 30 percent uh, allele frequencies here and in other parts of the world, and down in Singapore and, and Malaysia. So, so it really does vary, as does everything else, um, genetic in terms of uh, ancestral population. Shown here is a, a sort of a timeline from uh, Elizabeth Phillips and her group at, at Vanderbilt. Um, showing that, that on the class one side, this was the first association identified in 2002. Abacavir wasn't Stevens-Johnson. It was a, a similar kind, but not quite as severe um, uh, of uh, adverse reaction than the, um, the um, Chung group with carbamazepine. And you'll note all of these HLA, the, many of them are for multiple drugs. So the, the allele sensitize you to multiple drugs that aren't even necessarily chemically re related. Uh, and then a number on this side as well, making you wonder what is it that's going on in, in this region of the genome. Obviously, this is the part of the genome that presents um, um, non-self peptides to the immune system to be gotten rid of, and somehow that message gets messed up, uh, and a drug does the messing up, but it's not at all clear how that happens. Since um, um, these initial identifications, there have been uh, phenotype standardization projects. This is one that was published. Uh, you'll notice a uh, a name that you might recognize of a, of a group that worked together to uh, come up with a standardized phenotype, um, and then a kind of a uh, roadmap for identifying, you know, likely cases, because this, this isn't an easy diagnosis to make, particularly early on. Um, and then there have been uh, algorithms developed for assessing drug causality. One of the challenges, particularly in AIDS patients, but in others as well, is that patients will sometimes be started on multiple drugs all at one time, and you don't know which drug it is that, uh, that actually is doing this. Uh, and this is a, the algorithm there, and there's also a, a standardized algorithm for severity. So a number of, of tools for research now in place that uh, weren't available even 10 years ago. And the number needed to test uh, is, is shown here for a back of year. You only need to test an estimated 13 people because the, the predictive value is relatively high, as well as the, the prevalence is, is uh, a little bit on the high side. Whereas when you get down to some of these other drugs with carbamazepine in the U.S., you need to test about 1,000 people. Uh, fluclaxacillin was a, was a rare allele and a rare um, problem, um, but it was a serious one when it happened. Um, so you need many more. So again, we need to know much more about which, which variants in, in which drugs are cost effective and, and uh, relevant to be tested. So in addition to our current state of knowledge, there's a lot of uh, ignorance. We really don't understand the mechanism of the immune reaction at all. Uh, we had some HLA experts in the, in the room, and they sort of scratched their heads, and they said, you know, maybe we should look at expression of HLA alleles, because one of the challenges is that, that maybe, you know, one in 10, one in sometimes, you know, 20 or so of people who carry this allele will actually react um, to, the, to the drug. And thank goodness that they don't all react, but on the other hand, how do you then pick out the people who will? Um, the mechanism of cellular damage is not understood. Uh, the high-risk chemical features of the drugs, what, what is it? You know, is there a side chain that's causing a problem or, or whatever? Um, current treatments are really quite ineffective, and immune-suppressive treatments just have not worked. Uh, and it's, the treatment is largely supportive, um, um, frequently in burn units. These people end up in the burn units sometimes for weeks or months. 
Um, and as I mentioned, severe sequelae and can include blindness. Inc incidence estimates are really poor. This one per million is frequently quoted, but uh, a recent study from uh, the partners group suggested that it's much, much higher than that, um, maybe even 375 cases uh, per, per million. Um, and these were not just, you know, looking through ICD codes. These were, had some degree of, of validation, although not as, <coughs> as, you know, heavily validated as some other studies. And there are no in vitro tests for the causative drug. So as I mentioned, in, if you have somebody started on multiple drugs simultaneously, you have to stop them all and then kind of reintroduce them very gingerly and hope that you can, you know, pick up which one is causing the problem before all heck breaks loose. Um, in addition, there are many drugs that get into, into clinical use um, with having this complication, and you don't really know it until you use it in millions of people. Uh, and if there were a way to, to identify this preclinically before um, that those costs are spent in drug development, that would be a, a tremendous boon as well. Um, I just uh, show this here to, sh to show that there are at least three and probably more models of what the immune mechanism here is, and uh, no one really is sure which, which it is and how it works. So what follows is a, a number of, of very heavy text slides that are basically research questions and, and recommendations from the group. I'm going to flip through them relatively quickly. Um, but they, are, they are on the, the website. But, uh, but I think things that we'd want to think about and where we're asking for your help is, you know, where should NHGRI go in this, recognizing that we need to do it in collaboration with other institutes. Um, but what can we learn from ethnic-specific associations? There are some associations that only show up in, in certain ethnic groups. Uh, why does only a minority of risk allele car carriers develop this on, on exposure to the drug? Can expression levels help us? Why are many of the same alleles implemented over and over and over again? Uh, what's the impact of rare variation in HLA? Obviously, if you have an allele that's named, you've seen it enough times to get around to naming it. Um, and the rare variation, it's, this is the most variable region in the genome. Um, what's the impact of that? Um, is it possible, perhaps, to get DNA samples from drug trials that have been halted? Um, there have been a couple of really promising drugs in the diabetes field and that that have been stopped because of this complication. Couldn't we get samples from those patients and, and try to figure out why they're developing it? Um, could we use preemptive HLA typing in clinical care, maybe not just for, for this, but for a variety of conditions? I mean, people get HLA typing if they're going to be a donor, um, you know, bone marrow donor or other things. Um, could it be useful in a broader sense in, in treatment of rheumatologic conditions, autoimmune-related conditions? Could we use that information elsewhere as well as in pharmacogenetics? Um, what impact might that have on clinical care outcomes? Um, can we look at, at retrospective uh, uh, EMR data across uh, uh, EMR-linked biobanks to, to try to find out a bit more um, and, and identify more cases of this uh, to, to undergo study? Um, there were, as I said, several high priority uh, research um, um, recommendations. Again, I'm not going to go through them in, in detail, but just to mention that there was, you know, a, a number of basic research uh, questions, uh, clinical research, low cost testing was a was a high priority, uh, pharmacogenetic and outcomes research, particularly cost effectiveness uh, research, race ethnicity information. There's precious little known about uh, American uh, race ethnic groups. Uh, a group that hasn't been studied hardly at all is Asian Americans um, and, you know, Asians in other parts of the world uh, where we know that Southeast Asians are at high risk in their native countries. Um, sort of overarching and facilitative research, can we combine with international efforts? There are a number of international efforts ongoing. The U.S. is doing almost nothing in, in this area. Is there a way for us to work together uh, using standardized case that definitions and other things that I had showed you? Um, engaging burn units and specialists involved in the care of, of these patients. This is where they end up in the U.S. and Canada, um, and it's a, a good place to go to try to, to find them and to find investigators who want to do something about them. Uh, and we need some, there's infrastructure needs as well. Um, an international consortium would address many of these research questions that have come up. Pharmacosurveillance is another whole area that we, we kind of leave to the FDA, but to the degree that we can develop the phenotypes and other electronic uh, record tools that can help them, uh, we would like to try to do that. So I, I did want to, to kind of comment, as we had, had talked a little bit earlier this morning, about, you know, when do we go genome-wide and when do we go disease-specific? And obviously, NHGRI is on this continuum um, where we have, you know, a focus being genome-wide. You know, more close to the nucleotide, close to the sequence. Uh, we tend to be resource, bu resource building uh, and tool building. 
and paradigm setting. So when we get a little more specific, it's because it's kind of the first thing in an area and we want to follow it forward and then use that as an example for other fields. Whereas um, things that are more disease specific or specific problem solving uh, tend to us to be in the, in the realm of the disease specific ICs. And so clearly, you know, this is, this is something that really kind of falls on this boundary and we need to work together with those groups. So uh, where we kind of came down is, is that uh, a role that we could play is to stimulate high priority research. Um, and it occurs to me if we have somebody on the phone, they don't have my slides. So I'm very sorry. Is that Howard on the phone? Oh, I'm not sure who it is, but there are, actually I did send them to Howard. So. Um, so one thing that we could do um, is a large scale effort to identify risk alleles to include U.S. non-European groups uh, because most of this work has been done in Asians and Europeans, uh, assess rare variation in an expression of HLA, examine variable penetrance, uh, look at biologic mechanisms of risk. All of this requires not large numbers of patients carefully characterized, particularly early on in their course, uh, and assess the impact of preemptive genomic testing. And how we might do that, um, well, the, the, the house that we need or the tools that we need um, would be facilitating comparison and harmonization of phenotyping um, with, with uh, standardized case reports. We're working on that already with this group and have a, a subgroup that Carolyn and now uh, Jeff Strewing are leading uh, to try to get a, a much more harmonized approach to re reporting cases. Uh, and then working with the, the sister ICs that I mentioned to you earlier uh, to invite applications and contribute to ongoing international collaborations. So. That's an area that we will, we will try to um, pursue. And also facilitate interactions of relevant investigators at various meetings. Um, we're trying to call attention to the area. We've drafted a white paper uh, for publication that will be submitted soon. Uh, we'd like to publish half page-ish um, summaries and calls to action in specialty journals because this is, a, is something that really doesn't belong to any given set of investigators and no given medical discipline, but it needs to go you know, and be um, uh, notified to people in dermatology and neurology and people who use the drugs, rheumatologists, et cetera. So trying to get that word out. And working with patient advocacy groups. We had uh, patient advocate groups in, uh, at the, the meeting itself, and they were extremely helpful uh, in, in identifying the, the fact that uh, these patients suffer greatly, um, and they are very motivated to try to find uh, the causes of this condition. Uh, we're working currently on announcing uh, with, again, in collaboration with multiple um, institutes, a, a uh, program announcement that would just basically say uh, this is a, a priority area for our institutes and, and the details of that will be forthcoming, but uh, that was one that we thought we could do relatively quickly. Um, we'd like to pursue um, some feasibility, cost effectiveness, and perhaps other pilot studies in the coming year and in fiscal 17, likely through administrative supplements. Uh, and then when our other institute partners are ready to do something further, um, maybe prepare for a large-scale risk allele finding effort. Uh, I think Jeff mentioned earlier that, uh, that we have, a, you know, kind of in, in our thinking, um, a large effort potentially of, uh, for genomics of adverse drug reactions that would be broader than, than SJS-10. SJS-10 can be a good paradigm setting thing, but uh, uh, HLA seems to be relevant in, in many, many conditions and many adverse reactions, and so we could broaden that beyond. So, and again, just to, to thank the people I mentioned, Deborah, who helped uh, put this together in our planning group. And then I'll kind of shift over to you and ask the questions that, uh, that I hope were transmitted to you as we talked with you in our pre-council calls. Please advise us on what our role should be. I mean, I think right now we're playing a convening role. We also have, you know, some really cool findings that are, are genomic and that can drive people towards saying, gee, maybe this is something that doesn't just strike out of the sky, but, uh, but it's something we can do something about and then uh, help us uh, understand priorities for pursuing the workshop's recommendations for research and implementation. So we asked two council members to comment on this who have some, some history in this area. Um, and I might ask uh, Lon if you'd be, be willing to comment first and then Dan. There's, there, thanks, Terry. That was uh, really helpful, I think, to frame things up, up very nicely. There's this strange challenge, I think, in, in the drug discovery field where it doesn't matter what indication or what compound or, or what adverse event, most paths lead to, the H to HLA. And um, so at GlaxoSmithKline, we do a lot of um, preemptive type genetic research. We, we genome scan just about everybody that's in late stage trials before anything happens. But really where the value comes out is, that is when we get down to HLA. And, and so I think 
from my perspective, there clearly is, is immediate public health benefit to better characterize the cases and, and the diseases and try to predict better and annotate better the things coming through. But really, the big challenge, I, I would love to see people engage in is mechanistically trying to understand why this is happening, despite whatever medicine treatment and, and culmination you have. And as far as I know, and maybe Dan's or someone else is more up to speed on this, I don't think we've made much headway there. Uh, um, and maybe there's more, and I'd love to hear more. But to me, I think both sides of that equation need attention. That is the, the screening and the, the more traditional genetic side. Um, maybe at a genomic scale, maybe maybe not. But HLA mechanism is is really the the most compelling because if we could understand it better, we could predict um, new cases. And it seems to be a, a really good example. You know, it's like glaring you in the face, you know, pointing to HLA. And so, so if we can understand it there, maybe we can understand it in other diseases. Great, thank you. Dan. Well, I, I echo everything that Lon says. I, I think the uh, the tension that one of the tensions we feel <coughs> is this. You know, there's a lot of enthusiasm for preemptive pharmacogenomic testing in um, in routine clinical care, and and the the at the end of the day, HLA the HLA B related uh, adverse re reactions are you know spectacular when they occur. They're pretty rare, and the drugs are not the most widely used drugs. So. So we, in the implementation space, we feel the tension that, that it would be lovely to have everybody's HLA haplotypes precisely uh, documented and in their charts for when they might be exposed to one of those drugs. Uh, the, the, the issues are sort of the cost effectiveness of those kinds of approaches and the fact that HLA-B is one of the hardest regions of the genome to interrogate right now. I, I hope that that's going to go away. So, so I think it is a, a, the poster child for prevention, though. I mean, the, the one you know, prospective randomized clinical trial in the uh, in the pharmacogenetics spa implementation space that's shown a spectacularly positive result was on the back of your HLA B 5701. So that's that that echoes what Ron was saying. And then and then the the business of trying to figure out why uh, this happens to some people and not others is a huge challenge. So this is this speaks to this idea of going back to the to the siloing or not. Um, you know. It, there has to be an interaction between the basic communities and the, and the clinical implementation communities. So there's this drug, fluploxacillin, B star 5701 related hepatitis. To, to do HLA testing to prevent one case, you have to test 10,000 people for a back of the numbers, I don't know, 20 or 30 or something like that. So there's something else, and you know, we, we've talked about what that else, something else might be that. that that needs to be thrown into the mix to figure out it's not just the HLA and the drug, it's HLA drug and it's something else. And there are ideas around that, and I think there are people working on that. That this this has implications not just for pharmacogenomics, but for uh, transplant genomics, for cancer susceptibility, for the better management of HIV infections. So I think that that hopefully there's enough resources and enough smart people working on this that eventually we'll have an answer. Eventually soon. We'll have an answer. Great. Thank you. Other comments? But I might just, just note that on the, the comment that you made, Lon, about how some people react and some, some don't, you know, there, there are families where, you know, one person in the family has the variant, they react, other people and gets the drug, and other people in the family get the drug, have the variant, very scary, and they have, you know, been out for three years and they never reacted. And, and so, you know, why is that? Um, the other challenge there is, is if a large proportion of people who are uh, who have the allele would not react, you actually are shifting over to other drugs that, that may be more costly and you know, incur costs there, you know, preventing one case again. If you could figure out who that case was of the 100 who is the allele carrier, you'd be you know, more cost effective. Yeah, I have two minds whether to make this comment, but I will. In, in Hong Kong, they implemented a carbamazepine screening program. and. Uh, uh, they indeed managed to see a real decrease in the incidence of carbamazepine-induced Stephen Johnson syndrome, but an uh, equal rise in the incidence of phenytoin-related Stephen Johnson syndrome. So the number of cases actually was a wash. So it's it's it that just uh, reflects the fact that there's a public ed a public education or physician education effort that needs to be made around this as well. It's not trading one drug in for another. So that speaks to what especially one that's chemically kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Yes, Bill. <clears throat> yeah, as a pediatrician, someone interested in uh, newborn screening, uh, the numbers you present aren't, aren't so out of line with some of the things that they're screening for in newborn screening. So I think there's precedent. Mm -hmm. Lots of things. 
Harry, uh, what, you know, the, the last time I looked at uh, rapid, cheap, but high resolution HLA typing, um, it was so, sort of almost there or sort of there with next generation sequencing and costing maybe somewhere around $100. Do you know whether there's any push to improve that and make it cheaper and cheaper? Because $100 is not going to fly for newborn screening. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know that, that in the bone marrow field is what's been pushing this forward, and they've been, been quite effective at doing that. Dan, do you? Do you? I, I think this is an ongoing challenge. Uh, it is the hardest, or one of the hardest regions of the genome to interrogate. I defer to some people like Jay to sort that out for us. But, but um, uh, I'm told, and I think that this is, it makes intuitive sense that, you know, some technology that does much longer read should be able to sort this out. The problem is that, that, that it is a haplotype, and the short reads just won't do it perfectly. The imputation stuff uh, you can get, and it works, we think, for Caucasian populations, but we don't know how well it works in other populations. We have evidence that it doesn't work as well in African Americans. So, so, and I, all those methods are relatively indirect, I and mean, they're relatively imperfect. I think yes. If you're going to have a bone marrow transplant, you want to be HLA typed. You don't want to be HLA imputed typed. And and I think the same applies to preventing really catastrophic drug reactions. You want the real data, uh, not to say that imputed isn't pretty good. So 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 that's a long way of saying I don't know. I guess one other thing I would, I would say is that I think this does highlight one of the real issues when you have these cross-cutting problems in medicine where. There, there, there is no institute that will take full responsibility for looking into this, and yet it's really interesting and really important. Yeah. And so I, th I think what you've done by pulling all these people together and having this meeting is fantastic, Re really an interesting and great initiative. And I, I, I would love to see and everyone, everybody from GM and NIAID right through to mi minority, minority Health Institute ought to be interested in this. I mean, yeah. You know, to ask somebody whether they're Asian or not, when you have Tiger Woods, who's a Cablinasian, um, go after the genetics. I mean, don't ask these silly questions. I, I completely agree, Bob. It's, it really is a challenge when you have something that is this rare. It's, it's very hard to get people to attend. You know, I've never seen a case. It doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's, yeah. So we, we will keep working on it. Actually, one of the first cases I saw actually is, is an interesting scientifically, and that was a, a young woman who had mononucleosis. Yeah. And got ampicillin, and somehow it's the combination of having mono and ampicillin that raises your risk much more than mono alone mm -hmm. or ampicillin alone. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Yeah, you know, that's and that's an interesting one. I was taught as a as a resident that the you know that the, the test for, amp, for for mono is you give ampicillin and they get a drug rash, and that's and, <laughs> and that's how you know you've got mono. Uh, <laughs> but but ours didn't usually go on to SGS10. So okay, shall I go ahead to the Jay, did you want to solve our HLAB problem? <laughs> I mean, I, I do want to say there are people working on this, and it would be great to bring in, in you know, Peter Parham, my colleague at Stanford, and other folks at UCSF. We've got a big sort of HLA typing program trying to figure out how to bring in next generation sequencing. And, and also, not only HLA, but CURE, often types. Yes. You actually need to look at both. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a, a super great area to invest in. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I echo what Bob said. I think that if it is a problem that no institute wants to actually grab hold of, and looked at it from look, looking at it from this point of view, makes it an NHGRI problem, and that's a weakening lead. Well, and, it, and it's an NHGRI opportunity. I mean, you know, this is this is something we can we can really make a difference in. And, and it bridges lots of different parts of the strategic plan, from structure of genome to biology of genome to biology of disease, mm -hmm. improving healthcare. I mean, like the whole, poster child. Yes. Yeah. What, what's the current cost of that of HLA versus newborn screening? Out of curiosity. Oh. Well, uh, in Iowa, we screen for like sixty things, and it costs one hundred and sixty dollars for all of them. And HLA Total is one cost. for a hundred. Yeah. 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 So it's still it's up there. Okay. Can I can I just add Please. just Bob rattle off a number of the a number of the institutes that would be interested. Here, it, it seems um, from the drug discovery perspective, mm -hmm. where you're going to see these is, is when they arise really, really rarely mm -hmm. because they made it through the right. discovery because you didn't see it in any clinical trials, or when the risk benefit 
is, is a little bit more open. And that's why I think you see these sometimes more in oncology. And I would have put NCI on that, that list very strongly mm -hmm. as well. And now it may not be SGS10, but paths also lead to HLA for different and in NIDDK, because I, I think that there's hepatotoxicity that's also HLA mediated. Oh, very much so. Yeah, so Jay Hufnagel was, was heavily involved with us, and, and he, he put together the whole drug induced liver injury uh, network. And, and that, so, so, yeah. Yeah, so this is something I think we can get them. Hopefully, they'll get behind us. And, Lon, do you see things not, come, not make it through consequent HLA common reactivities? If, that if there's any hint of, for, for most indications for type 2 diabetes, any hint of safety, it doesn't, it doesn't progress, so you never see it. So there's a lot of potential drugs that could have been discovered you never, you'll never know because they won't even make it into late-stage trials. That's why I raised cancer, because their the risk benefit is more um, tolerable and they do make it further. So do you pick it up in animal testing and can we get an animal model out of that? Actually, in animals, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. I'd be, I'd be happy to end now. Um, all right. So, so then moving on to give you more of an overview of the Genomic Medicine Working Group, which was, which was the, sort of the grandparent of this particular uh, effort. Now, now telling you about a, a working group of you. Um, so the Advisory Council has two major working groups that I'm aware of. One of them you just heard from before lunch, and now this one. Um, and just to remind you who is on it, um, so this is the, the group. Um, and then Eric and, and Laura and I are sort of the ex officio folks from NHGRI. Okay. Um, the, uh, the GMWG was set up uh, about four years ago, shortly after the, the strategic plan was released, uh, to help us in charting this area, uh, particularly uh, to evaluate and implement genomic medicine and review progress, identify research gaps, identify and publicize key advances. Um, we decided we needed a series of meetings. Uh, we actually weren't sure it was going to be a series, but we knew we needed at least one um, and figured there probably would be others uh, to help us explore this area and also learn who is doing this work, bring them together and form you know, more of a community uh, of effort, uh, facilitate collaborations and explore models for uh, long-term infrastructure and sustainability. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've planned a series of meetings. These first three uh, were in, in uh, rapid succession. Uh, in the, the first uh, year or so after the, the strategic plan was released. And again, mainly to kind of develop collaborations and, and get people aware of what each, what each other was doing and not duplicate what each other was doing because there was a fair amount of, of siloing and, and duplication. Um, our fourth meeting was, was focused specifically on physician education because I think everybody recognized that, uh, that that was an area that needed to be addressed. Uh, our fifth was trying to develop federal strategies. That was one that uh, the gentleman you're going to hear from next uh, managed to make it to for a short period. Uh, and and uh, really asking our, our other agencies uh, what, what should we be doing together in, in implementing genomic medicine. Uh, the global leaders meeting that I mentioned to you previously, and in October we held one um, on genomic clinical decision support, uh, and the report for that has, uh, has gone in for, for publication. And then this uh, most recent one in June was a really kind of an overview. So the working group members said, you know, something that would be very helpful would be for us to take a step back and look at all of the programs all together and see how they fit together, where they could fit together better, um, and, and what the gaps might be. Um, and just to kind of give you a feel for what's come out of these meetings, so our first meeting actually led to a, a separate workshop a few months later uh, that we called Clin Action, and from that, the Clinical Genome Resource. Uh, or the ClinGen uh, uh, was born, and so that was a, a kind of a direct descendant, basically, of that first meeting where people were saying, you know, we've got all these variants, we don't know what they mean, we, we all sit down in a room and try and hash it out, and, and it seemed to us that if people were doing that in separate rooms in, in 20 or 30 or 100 places around the country, that we could organize and coordinate that effort and get it done much faster. Um, the eMERGE pharmacogenetic uh, effort also came in, in large part out of the, uh, uh, that first meeting where we recognized that pharmacogenetics was a ripe area and that we could uh, uh, be working in one of our large consortia to be able to, to implement it rapidly. Um, our second meeting uh, was on collaborations and that led to our IGNITE program where we really are trying to uh, take um, uh, centers that are expert in this area and, and, and then try to have them disseminate to, area, to, to centers that really don't do genomics at all. So, Family health clinics, uh, community health centers, um, uh, military, VA, uh, other, other kinds of places. Um, our third meeting um, involved payers. We really wanted to, to work with payers to understand what kind of evidence they needed in order to be able to support this kind of uh, uh, reimbursement for these kinds of tests. Um, our fourth 
how it led to the, on, on education, led to the Inner Society Coordinating Committee that you've heard about a few times uh, since at this meeting. Um, and the fifth one, uh, yeah, I have dotted lines here, not because I, because I didn't want to imply that our fifth meeting produced CMS, FDA, or the, or the Air Force, but, but what they, heaven knows, um, what they did produce were, were closer collaborations with those groups um, in looking at, at ways that we can, we can um, uh, share information and, and uh, collaborate to improve implementation where it's appropriate, um, not just willy-nilly. Um, the um, fifth one also led to a an, an, uh, trans-NIH working group within NIH. Uh, this is something we discussed with the institute uh, leaders uh, at one of their uh, strategic planning forums. And, uh, and they basically said, you know, we need to al also know, everybody needs to know what's going on within NIH. And it was that group that we drew from when we put together the uh, SGS-10 uh, planning group. Um, our sixth meeting, which was the Global Leaders Meeting, led to a global consortium called the Global Genomic Medicine Consortium, or G2MC. It is jointly hosted with the Institute of Medicine, and it will have another meeting in Singapore um, in November. And there are a series of areas that, that uh, groups are, are collaborating in uh, and also working with the Global Alliance uh, for Genomics and Health, which is much more of a research effort. It's more of an implementation effort. Uh, you've heard about that before, so I won't go into it uh, much with limited time. Uh, but out of that uh, group came the SGS-10 meeting that you just heard about. Um, our seventh meeting in um, uh, clinical decision support led to a much stronger collaboration with the Institute of Medicine Genomics Roundtable. And there's, uh, there was kind of a plan hatched for a uh, soup to nuts program in genomics clinical decision support at our meeting that is now being implemented in the, in the genomics roundtable. So that's very exciting. Um, and then uh, our eighth meeting uh, was just held in June. Uh, the objectives of it were, as, as often is, kind of where are we, where are we going uh, sort of meeting. So, um, uh, reviewing our portfolio, identifying gaps, identifying related programs for, uh, among other centers and ways that we could work together, uh, research needs um, for ourselves and our partner agencies to pursue. Um, and then we always try, and one of the reasons that we do these programs as large collaborative programs is that they can have an impact on a field and sort of pushing it forward or pushing it in a direction that, that no single investigator can have um, by themselves, no matter how good they are. Uh, and then examine potential methods for uh, assessing uh, the impact of these programs. So we decided to, to kind of focus on the, the six programs that are the major genomic medicine uh, portfolio. Uh, Parson, you've heard these described before, so I'm not going to go into detail uh, about them, but they're, they're here. Um, and, and our undiagnosed diseases, newborn screening, clinical sequencing, uh, eMERGE, um, the IGNITE program and dissemination, and then the ClinGen uh, resource. And then we also had a series of related programs that we wanted to hear from and have members in the room, um, you know, some of them in, in the very basic, uh, basic realms, some in informatics, as you, as you see here with GSIT, ENCODE was there, um, uh, representatives from the ILM roundtable, some from the NCI clinical trials that are genomically driven, et cetera. So, uh, so a large number that we tried to bring together and see where we had uh, joint opportunities. And then we asked for, for summaries from each of them. This is one from the clinical genome resource. Uh, it's basically a summary that describes, you know, who's, who's involved, what the mission or the objectives are. Here's another one for uh, newborn sequencing, uh, a third one for the Centers of Mendelian Genomics. Um, and in these, we, we asked for just two pages to describe the objectives, you know, what, what the funding period is, the working groups, the resources and tools that they've produced, publications. Um, obstacles and then approaches to meet those, those obstacles. And all of those are, are uh, stored and available on the website for this meeting, which if you search Genomic Medicine 8 or if you just go to Genomic Medicine Activities, the, the website for the meeting will come up and then you can find these meeting summaries. And we're, we're still referring back to them. They're very useful to have. Um, one of the things we asked them to do, as I mentioned, was to identify their objectives. And then we kind of looked across them to see, well, you know, what are objectives, particularly in the focus programs, that are really quite common um, across them? Because we would expect them to have some that would be in common. And as you might expect, these are, are very closely aligned with the goals of, of our division and the goals that the Genomic Medicine Working Group has outlined for itself. Uh, so integrating genomic data into patient care, incorporating actionable, var actionable variants into the electronic medical record, particularly with using clinical decision support, educating clinicians and patients, assessing the outcomes, um, defining and sharing how best to do this in, in best practices, promoting interactions and collaborations, uh, translating implementation outside highly specialized centers. And, and while this is Ignite's special role, actually several of the programs are, are doing this currently. There were also some that were, were pretty much targeted or, or unique to a, a given program. So uh, the UDN 
um, is, is very heavily emphasizing uh, improving genomic diagnosis and facilitating research in, in undiagnosed diseases. But Insight and Seizure do a little bit of that kind of work as well. Um, only Insight is looking at in newborn care. Uh, electronic phenotypes are something that is unique to eMERGE but is needed by all of these programs, really. Uh, identifying variants related to complex traits are, are shown in a, a few of them as well. Pharmacogenetics is pretty much the uh, um, uh, domain of eMERGE and IGNITE. Uh, looking at penetrance is pretty much uh, uh, eMERGE alone. Standardizing clinical annotation, assessing actionability uh, um, with uh, mainly Insight and ClinGen, and then creating a, a sort of genomics-enabled learning healthcare systems where we can actually improve care in a, uh, in a real-time way, uh, something that CSER, eMERGE, and IGNITE are really focusing on. And we also identified barriers that face multiple programs. Lack of an evidence base was one we knew four years ago. It's one we have now, and it's probably one that will be with us for, for as long as we're in this area. Um, the need for common data elements came up uh, repeatedly as something that we want to, to try to encourage across the programs. Um, assessing the frequency and impact of variants, particularly in ancestrally diverse populations. Uh, uh, something that is, is a particular problem, and as, as Eric mentioned uh, earlier today, that, that Bence had an entire workshop on. Uh, focusing specifically on, on why is it so hard to get information in ancestrally diverse populations, and we must have it. Um, rapid evolution of evidence in, on uh, uh, variants. So how do you deal with the changing levels of evidence? A, a variant that you thought yesterday was benign, now a report comes out and it looks like, oh, it might not be so benign. And a few more reports come out and, well, gee, it's pretty clearly pathogenic. How do you deal with that in, in relating to patients and clinicians? Um, the uh, current limited usefulness and interoperability of clinical decision support systems. So you build it in, in one hospital system and it works in, hopefully in that one hospital system but nowhere else. Uh, regulations that impede return of results have, have really gotten in our way in, in many ways with the, the research efforts that we're doing. And we're working with, um, with our colleagues in the regulatory field to try to address those but that's going very slowly and they are, it is having an impact both on the research and the clinical care. Need for cloud computing is, is growing as the sequence um, uh, data grow, uh, so, so does the need for uh, better ways to manipulate the data and transfer it and move it around uh, when needed. Uh, reimbursement policies and regulations I mentioned earlier, I think, and, and in pr a particular need for uh, uh, bedside back-to-bench research. So how can we stimulate that, that virtuous cycle where we find something at the bedside and can take it uh, back and really investigate it? Um, we set up a, a series of panels. Uh, these were the, the panel areas, and we asked them to, to then uh, address a, a number of questions. How important is this topic in this area? Um, what programs do we have addressing it? What are the gaps? What could be the synergies and the training opportunities? And then we, we asked each of the genomic medicine working group members to, to lead one of those and very much appreciated their efforts in, in doing that. Um, there were a series of, of recommendations that, that got a lot of discussion. Uh, maybe heavily discussed is a, is a little too strong, but, um, but I, I tried to pull out those that, that seemed to be uh, recurring just to, to kind of share them with you. And again, sorry not to have gotten these out to you sooner. They are in the report, um, and we'll, we'll post these slides so that if you want to refer back, you'll have them. Um, but generating evidence was, was an area that uh, everybody agreed was something we needed to, to do much more of. Uh, data sharing and improved phenotyping, particularly standards for phenotype description that you could use from model organisms to humans so that you can go back to the, the, to the bench um, when you've seen something at the bedside. A lot of interest in patient-oriented ontologies, so ways that patients can enter information on what their child has or what they have, what their symptoms might be, and that, that could still be um, in, in, uh, translatable in ways that cases could be picked up around the world um, uh, and linked together. Identifying and carrying out innovative studies, uh, particularly engaging basic scientists more actively in, in planning our programs because we don't have uh, that voice at the table very often when we have it at this table. Um, but uh, we need you to speak up more in terms of how we can do the science better. Um, an, an interesting idea was to add family history to a large-scale sequencing effort so that we, could, we might end up with 20,000 people who had both a, a rigorous family history, not, not an, you know, one that that took weeks to put together, but, uh, but something using some of the more uh, up-to-date software tools that can be done relatively rapidly. But if you had that on 20,000 people with their sequence information, imagine what you could learn about the added value of family history and, and how you need family history information to interpret, uh, particularly in rare sequence variants. Uh, studying the impact and consequences of changes in variant annotation, uh, facilitating implementation. Uh, uh, implementation commons was something that was, was very attractive to a number of the groups putting tools into a common place where people could then uh, use them and, and uh, share their, their experience in using them. 
uh, health disparities, and again, um, we, we discussed some of these last week, and you'll be hearing about them more. Um, but looking at, at specific health disparities, research questions related to genomics and implementation, um, developing dedicated programs for non-European ancestry populations, and increasing patient engagement, uh, education and training is, is always an area that is needed, um, and potentially joint training opportunities or, or best practices for clinician education. Um, one of the things that we did with this meeting uh, was to take, we had about 50 recommendations, and we thought, well, why don't we ask people to sort of tell us what their top 10 is? Um, so from the ones that I, I showed, pulled out about 20 of them to, to report to you, but, but we then, um, through our, uh, we, Duke University was working with us on this um, um, workshop, and so they sent out a little survey and said, just tell us what your top 10 are and rank them, you know, from 1 to 10. And then we kind of averaged those just to see which, which were those that, uh, that tended to, to come to the top. And you'll notice that, uh, that up here there are a couple that are really, you know, quite popular, and then there's maybe a little bit more of a shelf down here at 10 or 11. So. So I just pulled these out to show you um, what the, the top ones were. Um, and the top number one was measuring outcomes of value to patients, clinicians, payers, and then a whole list of other stakeholders. Um, so, so regulators, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how can we learn what outcomes are important to these groups so that we can add them to our studies? It couldn't, it might not be very difficult to do uh, and produce information that is much more useful to them. The family history tool came in second, so it was at uh, 3.5. Identifying types of evidence to collect and share across programs, accelerate rapid uh, genotype phenotype explorations. One of the big concerns was that a lot of these explorations take a very long time, and if you have a sick baby in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit, or if you have someone else who is really quite desperately ill, you don't want that process to take months or years. Um, suggestion was made to consider cooperative sequencing groups to gather information uh, about sequencing, much like the cooperative oncology groups that the NCI has funded at the, you know, basically the budget of this institute many, many times over <laughs> per year. So we couldn't do anything quite that grand, but at least something to consider. Um, and then a, a number of others that I, I just sort of show here, facilitating coverage through evidence development, identifying payers' needs, something that, that we are really struggling with. You know, what is it that payers really want to see? Not that we're trying to get everybody to pay for these things. We, we want to understand what is appropriate to be paid and what, and what isn't. And so how can we, we learn what evidence to generate for that? Um, Post-marketing studies, um, similar to uh, our pharmacovigilance studies, but for genetic testing. So can you, can you kind of gather information from people who've had genetic tests on what, the out, what their outcomes are and how they use that information? Um, some agreed upon nomenclature um, variant definitions and allelic identifiers that will help us with um, some of the, the um, uh, trading information back and forth, like the pharmacogenetic star allele system, which is very cumbersome and very difficult to work with. Uh, HLA is another area where nomenclature is a, is a major challenge, but are there other ways to, to work on that? Uh, computable guidelines um, to put into clinical decision support systems. Uh, clinical trials of the added value of whole genome sequencing to more limited testing. So uh, the question that we're doing in, in eMERGE right now, we, we can afford basically a, a hundred gene panel, and if we did a whole genome sequence, you know, and compared it, what would be the the risks and the benefits. You might identify a whole bunch of stuff you don't know what to do with and you just run up costs without any added benefit. On the other hand, you might find somebody who's at risk for carbamazepine toxicity that you didn't know and they might be, you know, about to get that or a related drug. Um, so our plans for uh, follow-up immediately are to engage basic scientists. This was, this came up over and over. We, we need basic scientists at the table and involved in, in developing our programs. Um, so, so, you know, we've, we've had uh, a lot of emphasis on this sort of pathway from the, from the bench to the bedside, and we really need to, to go back um, and, and be sure that the function is explored and other things are explored in the laboratory. Areas that, that seemed like they would benefit from this included phenotyping um, uh, that was compatible with model organisms to promote that kind of research. Uh, variant uh, nomenclature was one function um, uh, to help us with uh, clinical annotation. So those are the things that we are, are going to pursue, um, and that will be the, sort of the focus of our ninth meeting, uh, which will be held next April. Um, pursuing infrastructure needs, there, there were a lot of suggestions that were really kind of infrastructural, um, developed knowledge bases of what's going on in genomic medicine, uh, a variety of other things, the implementation commons, common data elements. Uh, those are things we're going to have to struggle with a bit because it, it, they don't really seem to lend themselves necessarily, and we would, would welcome your advice, uh, to funding opportunities where we say somebody you know, develop common data elements or increase patient en engagement in that. But there are things we need to think about a bit. Um, and then comparative effectiveness research. I, I may have put this on anticipating the, the next talk to come. 
Um, but we, we did hear uh, one, something that would be very useful would be uh, whole genome sequencing versus targeted panels. Another would be whole genome sequencing with or without um, uh, family history in large enough numbers to be able to, to draw some conclusion. Um, so these are the people that were involved in putting this together, and many thanks to them. And then back to you. Um, so we would welcome your comments on our, our recent activities and, and advice on the priorities that we've, we've outlined. Um, and I've asked uh, Carol Bolt and uh, Howard Jacob to comment. Carol, do you want to go first? So, of course, these are all very broad-ranging, giant areas of, of activity that, that were discussed and outlined, especially at the last um, genomic medicine meeting. Um, and and I'm, we've talked a little bit on our phone calls about, you know, how to how we can most effectively work together to move forward genomic medicine. And, and I think that, um, I think there's a, a number of things in the priorities that came out, and, and we're still discussing whether those are the right priorities. So really interested in people's comments about whether or not they feel like the ones that came out of the survey, which I forget, Terry, how many people responded it to the survey? It was a small number. So we had about yeah. 88 at the, at the meeting and 35 responded. Yeah, and that's that's always a, a challenge, right? We we hold these meetings and then you ask for feedback and you get feedback from a very small number of people and that ends up being your recommendations and priorities. So part of the benefit of bringing it out to the group like this is to you know, is that a biased sense? Is that is, is there general agreement with these these priorities or not? Um, and just with respect to uh, the planning for for GM nine, you want me to comment on that Please as do. well? So the so the, as Terry said, uh, one of the themes that emerged a number of times during GM8 was this integration of basic science um, and how that can effectively promote and advance genomic medicine. And um, you know, it goes back to what Eric was saying earlier this morning about the fact that you know we have all these fun all these variants come out of these genome sequencing projects, and we don't know their their biology. We don't know what they do. And to effectively integrate that information into genomic medicine, we have to functionalize them. Um, and so this virtuous cycle that Terry uh, had the slide on, that we, we want GM9 to kind of focus on that virtuous cycle. Um, how can we better integrate, especially the arc that goes from the patients back uh, into the, the model organisms and how we develop the models themselves, right? When we talk about models, that means so many different things to so many different people. And in even being able to communicate effectively about what a model is and what it means um, is important to do. So that's going to be, currently, that's going to be our focus for GM, GM9. Um, Howard? Howard, did you want yeah, to Yeah, so, so I, think that's a, I think that's a great summary. Um, I would only add uh, one additional point to what uh, Terry and, uh, and Carol have mentioned, and that is that connection at the basic research level um, it, it, we need to also be able to do it, and Terry did say this, but we have to do this much, much faster uh, because as we're doing more and more of this clinical sequencing, you know, it's right at the edge of care slash research, um, and we're finding these variants of uncertain significance. So, so not only do we need to think how to functionalize it, but how do we do this fast enough to, pr to provide information back to the patient uh, or to the physician in order to try to uh, affect care? So that's all I had to add, but I, I thought it was a good summary. Great. Thank you. Comments from the group? I, I, I just would echo what Carol said. I mean, I, I think that uh, we've spent a, a, a lot, GM 1 through 8 on sort of looking at other communities. And, and as we were planning for GM 9, we said, well, there's one community that we really haven't engaged, and that's our basic science colleagues. And everybody around this table, from the most clinical to the most basic, recognizes that. That the potential for that virtuous cycle, functionalizing, I like that word, uh, variants of uncertain significance is a huge problem. And there are many, many other, uh, I'm sure, uh, opportunities that the clinical data sets that we're generating should offer to the basic scientists. And there are other things that basic science should be offering to us besides just function telling us whether a, a particular SNP is functional or not. And that's why we have to have that. Yeah, you know, just that uh, this this it's a great comment, and this goes back to what I was talking about in terms of a model. So we're used we're used to thinking about models of of understanding the basic biology, but there's also 
model systems to look at at therapy outcomes, right? And so those those can be completely different models, and but we, we tend to lump them all under the same thing. And I think this meeting could help us start to tease some of those things apart so that there's really good communication. And I, I might note that, that uh, we have that scheduled for April 19th and 20th, I believe. That's a Tuesday and Wednesday, I think, um, in uh, 2016. I'm not quite sure if it'll be in Bethesda or if in, or in more, a more central part of the country. Uh, but we would hope that, that folks would put that on your calendars. And Eric, I know you love to come to Bethesda, so if we have it in Bethesda, you'll be there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if we hold it in Houston, you won't be there. <laughs> so, great. And, yeah, any other comments? Great, thank you very much. Um,